Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to Rule of Law in the New Abnormal. And welcome to today's discussion about race, caste, learning and education. Where are we? What's missing? Where do we need to go? And wherever else these four amazing people choose to take us. We have Ben Davis, retired law professor from the University of Toledo School of Law, now teaching online with the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law, Professor Vernalia Randall, retired professor from the University of Dayton School of Law, and one of the country's leading experts, one of the international leading experts on race and the law for many years. Hey, Jeff Fortnoy from Honolulu, one of our leading First Amendment lawyers, a partner in the Cage Shuddy firm, and Jim Alfini, former dean of Northern Illinois and Southern Texas Schools of Law and professor at both constitutional law professor and ethics law professor. Welcome all of you. Yeah. I'm gonna follow my mother's guideline and do ladies first here. And also because Professor Randall is our resident expert in this area. <laughs> Out of all the things going on relating to critical race theory right now, Professor, what strikes you as what is most deserving of attention? For me, the part, the issue is, is that the critical race theory is being used like super predators was used by the Clintons, like welfare queen was used by Reagan as a uh, cover for allowing people to be racist without using the words Black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, uh, and to be racist. Uh, and so the big problem that I, I'm having is that uh, over and over again, I'm on all these sites and people asking questions. I'm like, None of these states have critical race theory in faith K through 12. Now there's all kinds of things people are claiming is critical race theory, but it is not. What they're really upset about, these, uh, what they're using this for is a vehicle to not talk about accurate racial history. And so the, uh, and, and most of all these laws that have been passed, it, only one state even mentions the word critical race theory. All the rest of them is about, mm, you can't talk about slavery, and you can't talk about racism, and you can't talk about diversity. Uh, so there's a need for people to know what critical race theory is, which started off as a legal concept, as a law school concept. And there's a need to know that 99.99% .99 of what they hear uh, going on is not really critical race theory. Thanks, that's a great intro to start off. <clears throat> Jim, Jeff, Ben? I don't know what critical race theory is. I'm sorry. Okay. No, I mean, <laughs> if you look at the words critical race theory, it makes no sense as, yeah. as some kind of a philosophy or uh, an educational component. I, I understand what people are trying to do in these various states, but I really never figured out how critical race theory got into the lexicon. Well, it's a term of art. So I have to say, being a lawyer, you understand that there's a lot of things that we use in language that have specific definitions. So you can't just say critical race theory. You have to know what it means. It's a term of art looking at how racism has impacted how systems work. And it started off, it really started off with uh, Professor Dean Bell, 
uh, and uh, looking at the law. How has the law, how does the, how is the law structured? How is the law interpreted? How is the law implied, applied in a way that either promotes or diminishes racism? You would think that would be a part of all courses. It's not. And consequently, critical race theory came about as a way to focus people's attention on that. Now it's spread to other disciplines to do the same thing. How does uh, racism impact education, sociology, that sort of thing? Does that help? I, I thought, maybe because I think about this simplistically, it simply meant you couldn't teach in school that white people ever did anything bad. That's what the <laughs> isn't that it? <laughs> that's that is essentially <laughs> what yeah. <laughs> that's essentially what it's being turned in. Well, the opposition to critical race theory is that we don't want the critical race te theory teaches people that the the systems don't work equitably based on race. And we don't want you to teach that because white people have been in charge of systems. And so implicitly, you, you it feels like you're charging white people specifically, an individual white person specifically. Yeah, that, that I think you're right. That's funny. Good. <laughs> it, Vernelia, if I can add a footnote to what you Go said. Ahead. I mean, Please Jeff, do. Vernelia has, has very accurately and well described critical race theory as it was developed largely in the law schools by legal scholars like Derek Bell. Um, and what what's happening now, I think, is that m critical race theory is being mischaracterized and exaggerated and basically is understood, uh, uh, the conservative leaders are trying to get people to believe that critical race theory stands for anti-white and black supremacy. Um, and that, and, and, and it really, they're saying that pretty loud. Um, and they're, they're trying to get people excited about this so that they'll stop things like the teaching of race in schools. Um, if, if we take it outside the schools, I, I really believe that this is a, an organized, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to use the word strategy, uh, on the part of people on the right to um, discredit some of the policies that are, are being adopted by major corporations and organizations, particularly diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. I've seen it myself um, used to attempt to forestall the adoption of DEI policies. Oh, sure. But uh, can I just say, it's like the classic American talk about something without talking about it. Because flipping it in terms of it being something to support, quote, black supremacy, really what it's about is supporting white supremacy, but flipping the conversation to be That's about right. the other, to really right. reinforce white supremacy. That's, That's the game. And it's as old game as dirt in this country. All right. Well, and so, you know, so you got to understand that when everybody's running this stuff, it's not about the stuff. It's about the white supremacy. Or this sense of fear, which is very bizarre in a way, but there it is, of white people of being quote unquote replaced. I mean, there'll be other theories you'll hear, the replacement theory. I've heard people use those kind of words, but in kind of couched ways, but sort of, sort of you know, and it's like, really, really? I mean, and another thing is, of course, um, you have people personalizing the history that, well, like I wasn't a slave owner, therefore I am immune for any kind of part of that history, you know? And, you know, I'm coming from it as an international law guys that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong folks, but far as I know, the United States state has been around at least since 1776. 
So whoever was the actor in the state allowing this, that, or the other to happen, that state has been continuous for all that period. And that state actually embraced, encouraged all kinds of suppression. With you know, We can talk about the Fugitive Slave Act. We can talk about uh, the... Uh, um, uh, I, I, can, I can send you cases where you have judges in the antebellum period talking about the natural place of blacks is in an inferior position in judicial opinions, okay? You know, as part of their analysis. I can I tell you, think, yeah. I do think it's being used as a cover for targeting, for channeling people's fear and anger. I absolutely do because we're in uh, with all the dis and misinformation around. Uh, we're in a period where all people just we've always been in a period. Like, throw out some code words, define the code words to mean something that will appeal to your group, your base, and then you don't, and then they will then rally around without actually learning what it is. And will call you a liar like so I can't tell you how many times I have defined its critical race theory for people given people a link to more stuff they can read and then be told don't be spreading my democratic lies which I'm like hey, you you don't know me at all because you would know right. I'm not a you know you know there's 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 a and this is an important issue but there's a bigger overriding issue Right now, it's critical race theory. The overriding issue is the legislature telling teachers what they can and can't teach and then criminalizing it. Right, now it's, right now, it's critical race theory. Next week, it could be anti-Semitism. The week after that, it could be whatever. That's the outrageous thing that's occurring in these eight states. Yes, it's critical race theory that's generating what they're doing. But what they're doing is politicians are telling teachers not only what they can teach and can't teach, which is Hitler's Germany, but also criminalizing it. Right. That's authoritarianism. What... Absolutely. Textbook authoritarianism. And the irony, right. of course, is it's done by the people who are asserting the concepts of freedom, right? And freedom. And again, it's one more of these little flips. One more of these little flips using the, the language to put in place authoritarianism. It's the, the criminalizing is, is a new factor, but the fact is that nah, I hate, excuse me, because I hate when other people do that, and I apologize. I hate it when somebody says the fact is just say what you got to say. Uh, the, the reality, as, as long as I can remember in my lifetime, Texas has dictated what teachers can teach. They dictated them to me as a child, the, the textbooks, the uh, controls, the, the criminalization, it, they're being more overt about it, but it has never been a case of where teachers get to teach what they want without politicians telling them what to teach. Uh, that's what the Board of Educations do. They control what can be taught in the school, and that control can be racist, which it was in my life in Texas. Do you, do you think they taught me about slavery? Do you think about Jim Crow, about the 1790 Act that said that only white people could immigrate into this country? No, none of that was in any of the textbooks. They didn't teach me about that, uh, how the United States supported the overthrow of the kingdom of uh, the constitutional monarch of Hawaii and how the legislature uh, found that to be illegal and we just ignored it. No, none of that was in my books. They didn't teach me about the Chinese being excluded. So this whole, you know, the thing is, 
they're just being more overt and more explicit because they're appealing outwardly to a base that they want to mobilize around racism. And Jeff, this is, you know, it's, it, it, they are using criminal criminality that's a different aspect, and 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 yes, it can be extended to other areas as well. But the issue of controlling what is being taught about race and racism is not second. No, but I want to be clear about this because I don't disagree with you that boards of education have always determined what textbooks are being ordered, and et cetera. But the move to make it political by having legislatures do it is new to me. Oh, okay. So it doesn't change it, but I'm just saying it's now gone from the Board of Education, which in some places are elected and some places are appointed. And it varies, right? Hawaii has a statewide Board of Education. Where I grew up, every little city in town had their own Board of Education. But I don't think it's ever been centralized in the legislature of a state or not as much as it is now. And so that's my only point. I, I hear you and I understand that that Texas has been in the forefront of uh, a textbook uh, uh, control. Yeah, and my, but, my, my thing is, is, is that that this is this isn't they aren't doing it could be done in other areas and it probably will be but this is really an attack on people of color in an yeah. accurate racial history right agreed agreed and, and and white people who want to know accurate racial history right but let me give you two examples just to throw things at you everybody remembers d-day okay we all remember d-day in every school that we ever went to right and we all maybe saw The Longest Day, which was a 1962 movie that with John Wayne and all the great stars of the day, or maybe Saving Private Ryan, 1998, and all that, and all that stuff going on in D-Day. Well, it wasn't until last year that I learned that there were black soldiers at D-Day. They were running the barrage balloons. Now, and I was thinking, why in all those movies and all that collective discussion of this great, incredible event, no one along the way, by the way, let us know that there were actually black soldiers among all those soldiers. I think there were uh, uh, Asian American soldiers who were there too and Hispanic, but certainly black soldiers who were part of D-Day. Why, we, why wasn't there any black soldiers in Saving Private Ryan? Why weren't there any black soldiers in uh, The Longest Day? I mean, that's the, that's the part of the false consciousness thing that uh, is not just vehiculed by these legislatures, but is vehiculed in the, in the collective culture to basically make people of color invisible, just like at the University of Virginia here where they used to have these walls to make the enslaved people invisible to the people who were going to the University of Virginia, just like at Monticello, uh, Jefferson structured his house so that you never saw the slaves. You understand? It's the invisibility thing. It's just like segregation of neighborhoods, you never knew any Black people or Hispanic or Asian American people. So they didn't exist in your conscious as a, just like the segregated schools thing. I mean, it's all these structural things being put in place to make these people of color invisible. And unfortunately, for those who want to do that, these people of color have been around since the beginning of this country. And we're here, and we know it, and we know the history, and we assert our but humanity. But the problem is white supremacy, it goes back to what you said earlier. The, the whole problem is, is, is that if we want system and institutional changes, white people got to know their own history. Well, right. And, and, I know and, and it's not enough for us to teach you, because I'm in a lot of networks now where people are just saying, oh, don't worry. We'll just teach our kids ourselves. No, that no. ain't the solution. No, look. The solution, you. you know, and at law schools. And the fact is, is the critical race theory <laughs> has never really been accepted in law schools. Right. And if truth be told, you know, how many, uh, Dean, how many critical race theories do you know about in law schools? 
great. No, but, you're right. But, you know, Jim and Jeff and me and you, we were the generation that was going to solve it after Brown, remember? That we were going to integrate and everybody was going to know each other and all this was all going to be worked out. That was the idea of, of integration that was there. And, you know, there's some things that are definitely better than they were. Huh? I'm not saying they weren't. But we sit here today and we and we watch this nonsense, sorry to say it like that, because of this false consciousness that is advantageous to some folks to maintain for their own reasons, and they will do it. And, but but you know, to, we, to, if they are successful, and they are being successful, part we're a nation divided, and they're being successful in the states, and that if you are, the problem we have I taught race and racism for 30 years. And when I initially started, I wanted to teach it as a critical race theory course. I wanted to teach it as a critical race theory course. I did not. I taught it two years as a critical race theory course and thought, I can't teach this. My students don't know. It didn't matter what color they was, what background they were, they did not have enough history, racial yes. history, to do critical race theory analysis of the law. Well, well but, but, you and know. And so I ended up having to teach them just history with law with woven in. Now, the problem becomes if we want changes in history, if people are coming, going through high school college without learning accurate racial history and they're going to be the leaders of the world, uh, they are not going to be receptive to changing systems they don't think are racist because they haven't been taught how that has happened in our history. You know, but... But but the but the but the educational system goes way beyond that. You look at all the surveys in the last ten years. People coming out of high school don't have a clue what the Bill of Rights are. Forget right. about well, critical race theory. They can't. They can't tell you. No, I'm sorry, but it's true. They can't tell you who the last five presidents were. Uh, I mean, so the whole well, educational system, as far as history and civics is in shambles and this is part of it i agree but well, you know it's it's you know, not only that i mean it, it's unbelievable what lack of education high school graduates are getting on on our country on history rightfully or wrongfully by the way how is it that college students go through college because i got law students in my class and in fact, I had someone just, uh, one of the law students who took my class years ago, because I said, what usually happened is by the end of my class, the law students would say, how did I get to law school and not know this? <laughs> Great. Well, I hear you. A yeah. good question. How <laughs> did you get to law school? Yeah. I can understand K through 12, but I don't understand how colleges are not teaching it. And I do not understand how law schools make it a specialized course. Okay. Well, I so want to go that, farther so than that. that. People can Wait. get through law school, second and third year, and if they don't take a race and racism in the law course, they don't learn it either. Right. So well, it, Professor it's Randall. not just K-12. Right. But Professor Randall, I'm 65, right? So how is it that at 65, I only found out John Marshall, who has a huge statue in the Supreme Court of the United States, was a slave owner. I mean, I went to law school. I spent 40 years of my life doing this, that, or the other. And it was only in the last year or two that I find out that John Marshall was a slave owner. In every one of my classes in law school, we talked about Marshall decisions and this, that, and the other. No professor... In any class, it don't have to be a criminal race threat. Just the ordinary con law professor could mention, by the way, John Marshall owned slaves. You know, I mean, we get, you know, we get the Justice Taney thing, right? You know, and all that. But on John Marshall, a lot of people look up to, there's this sort of vote you don't mention these things about. 
I also know Justice Jackson, right? Justice, I have to learn this because I went to a thing at Justice at the uh, the Center for Jackson in uh, in uh, Western New York. You know, in a letter to somebody, he wrote, he used an N word. Okay, I mean, he, he used an N word in a letter to him, and something wasn't worth an N word's note, right? He's a man of his time. No one knew this stuff until the particular expert, John Barrett, on on Justice Jackson, had found this and going through his papers. Well, you know, Justice Jackson, uh, you know, and his, what is this three-part theory of the structure of how the, you know, but by the way, did you happen to know that he was using that kind of ragtag language too? That would have had an impact on me, you know? And then finally, let me tell you, Justice Scalia, I can't, I, he once told me I had to get over slavery. A guy who can't get over the slave owners telling me I have to get over slavery. I mean, you know, it's like, come on, is this real? Or you can have Justice Alito telling the representatives for uh, blacks in Michigan who were fighting the referendum when the, the representative in the oral argument says, I quote, 90% of the black Michiganders voted against the referendum. And Justice Alito says, well, they just don't know what they, they may not know what's good for them. And they start talking about the mismatch theory and all this stuff about going, like, like those black people don't have agency. And this is a justice of the Supreme Court in the oral argument. Or Derrick Bell, when he was a lawyer in Brooklyn and having judges turn around in their seats because he was a black lawyer and they wouldn't, they would listen to his arguments on, behind, on, on behalf of his client with their back turned to him. Oh, I'm sorry. So how do we get... So, but the question for me is, we need to have a critical analysis of how race and racism impact systems. And I don't know, I spent 30 years, I, I, I taught race and racism for 30 years, would still be teaching it if they hadn't canceled the course in my law school. So it is, how do we, you know, we talk, we can talk about what K-12 is critical and all of that stuff, but we haven't managed to get it in law schools. And I would really like to hear the dean's ideas about critical race theory uh, are not just, just accurate racial legal history in law schools. And that's a great question, Professor. So in our last minute or so, how do we get out the truth about what has divided us as a society in ways that can help people understand those divisions and get past them? What's the direction we need to take? Well, I always got an idea. Stop dumbing down people. And, um, and you know, the main thing is you fight back, meaning you put out the accurate history. You counter the folks who have extensive power, who try to put out the nonsense version of everything. And you just keep doing that until they finally either give up or uh, flip into something else. And if you okay, don't but... fight back, they will suck up everything. But if you can keep out there pointing out things that this is nonsense, this is not true, if you can help people get back, back past their guilt, you know, about the fact there was slavery. I mean, I was shocked. Somebody recently, I was talking about my ancestor who was owned uh, by uh, uh, some of the Harrison family here, and they look so guilty about but then, it. That, that sounds like... And, and if I, I'm thinking back to my public here, that sounds like an individual approach with individual people. And I think we, how do we change systems? How do we get yeah, law I'm schools to, how do we get law schools to integrate accurate racial history in all of their courses? Well, good, yeah, good luck, I, good, good luck, folks, because Ben. <laughs> All you got to do is look at what goes on in Germany and Poland about their views about World War II and what happened to the Jews. I'm sorry. That's only 50 years ago. And uh, 
very few people's perceptions have changed as to what they think those two countries did or didn't do. So it's a huge, huge undertaking. And I, I frankly think you might change some people's views. But let me go back to where we start on this show all the time. 35 to 40 percent of this country still believes the election was stolen. So good luck. And I don't I think everything needs to be done, but I'm not as optimistic as you are. And well, we're out of time for today. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but neither was Dean Derek Bell optimistic. In fact, he, he died right. seeing that the one step forward was always followed by two steps back whether it was Brown versus Board of Education or affirmative action or any of the other measures that were intended. We need to go back and completely revisit how we come to understand race, caste, and the divisions in the society that have been perpetuated and that are still fighting to perpetuate themselves. That's exactly what you folks have brought out today. I thank you all for great insights Thank you for inviting us. Candid, lively conversation. Come back, see us in two weeks. We'll be back September 30th. Rejoin us. And thank you all. Take care. <laughs>